Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter, Peter Reinhardt, and uh, welcome back. I've got a really interesting episode today, one that I'm kind of excited about because I'm with Chef Ryan Hardy of uh, of uh, Bar Pasquale, of of Pasquale jo Pasquale Jones, a whole bunch of restaurants in New York City. So you're you're in you know in what the lower the little Italy part of New yeah, York. Yeah, we're Lita, all downtown and, stuff. And yeah. and and you got all these restaurants going, but. We haven't seen each other for 25 years. I know. We're finding out as we're reconnecting for today's show that that you were a student at the California Culinary Academy when I was teaching there and you were in my class. So, yeah. and I'm wondering 25 years ago, you know, you must have been a kid, but <laughs> hard to believe. So we got to catch college. up a little bit yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah. you you were a culinary student there for a while? Yeah, and Peter, thanks so much for having me on. This is this is a this is really cool. I'm a fan, a fan of the uh, the podcast and and uh, so much more. So, um, uh, really an honor to be here. Um, yeah, I, I had gone to college. I I, uh, I went to Xavier University and and um, um, finished at University of Kentucky. And grew up in the Midwest. Um, really had to get out of 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 that part of the the country and see something new. Drove to the West Coast and and I had put myself really through school by cooking and bussing tables and dishwashing and, you know, whatever I could do in the, in the restaurant business um, uh, and various other jobs. And uh, when I went out there, I started building homes, believe it or not, and cooking at night and, and decided uh, there was something to this. I really loved the camaraderie, the militaristic uh, uh, hierarchy of, of restaurants. And, and I found that I was very detail oriented and, and I, and I loved how detailed uh, things like, like cooking can be. And so, um, so I enrolled at California Culinary Academy and I, and, and I was, unfortunately I was, a I think at the time we, we call them savory or sweet. I think that's how we referred to each other. Uh, sweet, I was a savory yeah, student. Yeah. 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 And, yeah and otherwise yeah. you were baking and pastry, which was sweet. And so I was able to take one class in the other division and it was your class. And, and, um, I think at the time, if I'm not mistaken, you, you might've been working with, in a bread competition with France uh yes. which was a big deal right yeah 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 i was i was getting ready to uh to to uh well how did it work i was i was competing in the james beard national bread competition and the prize mm -hmm. was that you got a one week all paid experience to stage at any bakery in paris that you could work out a deal with and i ended up in, and i won the competition so i i was in new york city I baked my loaves off at amy's breads uh you know up on uh, in hell's kitchen <laughs> And then we went down to the James Beard house in the snow, big snowstorm, ended up winning. And I yeah. got to, to, to Paris. And instead of doing like a stage at one place for a week, I asked the uh, Nick Mal Malgeri, who was running the whole show, if I could instead go to five different bakeries uh, over five days, spread it out over five days and do a different place each day. And Incredible. we did it. We it up. So I got yeah. to meet Lionel Polan and all these great bakers over there. Yeah. Uh, and so the, and it all started while I was. I was, you know, teaching at the California Culinary Academy. So you were, you were a culinary student, but you got to do uh, the bread, the bread class was my, was it sort of I the did. Class, um, yeah, which yeah, was yeah, class. Yeah. We were just getting it pioneered then back in, in the yeah. mid nineties, there weren't a lot of culinary schools teaching quote artisan breads. So we were moving the dial on all that. I'm so glad you got to be a part of that. You were, and I, I'm, I've been fascinated with bread my whole life. Um, I think uh, it's something that it's 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 one of the oldest foods out there obviously uh it it, it transcends I, I believe that um you know not to pull out that kind of theologian card for a second but i but i do <laughs> believe that anthropology is is uh is told through the story of food right uh from generation yes. to generation and and i think bread is is a part of that every single culture has their version of that and and bread is so central to the food that i create uh, in fact, carbs are, but we don't tell anybody that. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, and and I think that that we've been fortunate that that has been you know renewed as of recently. I think COVID certainly changed a few things there in all of our restaurants. But but um, but our ability to spend time on those things, uh, not just as consumers in our homes, but also uh, as chefs in our restaurants, um, it's been something that's been really central to our to our restaurants. Uh, yeah, over the and last not few only years. Did, did you follow in sort of the breadcrumb trail, but it led you. Yeah. Into following me this other path that i've been on too and now you're you're doing killer pizzas I know. of different styles and and i would want to yeah. talk about your menu at, at yeah. both bar pasquale and also uh pasquale jones and and thanks and different uh, where are you coming to us from at this moment are you in in uh, pasquale jones or bar pasquale 
I'm sitting in the bar right now. Um, Park Pasquale is right next door to Pasquale Jones. We're on what we call the Ken Mare Corner. We're in Little Italy, and um, uh, Mulberry Street is is to my right, and um, uh, the corner of Ken Mare, which is the Williamsburg Bridge coming across, is right outside yeah, okay. the window here. And and so we do, um, uh, you know, they're sister restaurants. They're joined underground. We share some some kitchen and some storage space on both sides, and. And it was important as we, you know, the original restaurant was Pasquale Jones next door. We opened it in 2016 and it was, it was all about wood fired and, and Neapolitan food and pizza. And when we took this on, um, we, we built it during COVID and, uh, and a friend of mine asked me um, as I was building it, I, which had never occurred to me, he said, um, so you're going to have, you're going to have your pizza there, right? And I thought, well, there's a line out the door for that side. That's why I was building it over here. And I said, "Oh uh-huh. man, I, what, what am I going to do? I, I can't. I don't can't produce enough pizza over there." So I had to, I had to uh, really think about it as I was as I was producing. Yeah. And I said, "You know, this is. I love Sicily. I I, I I'm so uh, head over heels for Southern Italy and and uh, and the islands there." I said, "This is this really needs to be an ode to that as as much as that is to 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 Napoli and Campania in general." So, so basically, uh, you're covering you know, the, the Neapolitan Naples, you know, world on, at one restaurant and then jump over yeah. a little bit of that little pond between the two and, and <laughs> you get to spend some time in Sicily kind of uh, doing a deep dive yeah. in cuisine. Yeah, I have over the years. Um, uh, my wife, about half of my wife's family, she grew up between the U.S. and Italy and, and half of her family is from Campania. And so we spend a fair amount of time in and around that region and, and have jumped over to Sicily a few times uh, uh, and really experienced so much of it. And, and you know, I think you know, debunking a lot of the myths about what Sicilian food is and, and certainly what, what our idea, there's no such thing as Sicilian pizza truly. Um, but, but, you know, kind of understanding what, what they refer to as finchione, which is, you know, kind of a, a snack that you, that you eat um, uh, as part of a meal, which is happens to be pizza or similar to what yeah. we consider pizza is, is how the, the kind of the path started with this. And so I, I dug that up. I did a barnstorming trip back over there, took the team said, look, guys, here's, this is what I'm thinking. And I gave them the pitch uh, on it. And then we came back and, and started experimenting with, uh, with the, the pizza from there. Was it a hard pitch to make or were they all in from the start? Oh, they were all in. They're like, wait, give me this straight. You want to take me to Sicily tomorrow? I said, yeah, yeah we're going. exactly. <laughs> I'm thinking it was an easy sell. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, so if, since, since we're uh, on the Sicilian side of the, of the walls right now, and you're playing, yeah. talk a little bit about what, what it is, what's distinctive and, and differentiating between Sicilian and, you know, the Neapolitan styles of cuisine? You know, I mean, gosh, to, to kind of back up, take a 38,000 foot view, I think what's distinct about pizza in general, um, it's it's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, certainly no one knows that better than you. Uh, there, there are, gosh, there, there are there are two things that you're never going to win a battle on. Right. And, and that's like uh, trying to tell a New Yorker how much more New York you are. And, uh, <laughs> and then, and then trying to convince somebody that this style of pizza is the best. It just, you're never going to win. Everybody has their own version of it and, and, and loves. And I think, um, uh, you know, taking that down to, to what Sicilian is and, or what Neapolitan is or what New York is or what Detroit is, you know, you can, you can classify those, but there are so many subsets and tweaks within each one of those categories that make, I think that's what the love of pizza. That's why these things are so unique and so cool and exist all around the around the world in in great ways. Um, Sicilian to me has it's it, it's a little bit um, a little bit taller certainly than than what we think of as traditional uh, let's call it American or New York pizza slices or or certainly Neapolitan which is quite soft and and bready. Um, it is um, it's it's closer to focaccia. It's a very thin focaccia. And um, it's a high moisture dough that um, uh, is a long ferment in our case. And then their their toppings, you know, they they often include uh, tomato sauce. Usually that's where they stop. <laughs> and yeah, um, yeah. sometimes some hot chilies on there, maybe a little oregano or some garlic. Um, but it's really uh, pizza rosa in its classic uh, form. Um, uh, and then we kind of- Is it baked you know, in a pan or on a heart? Yeah, it's baked in a pan, um, always in a pan. Um, the um the little bit of uh, crust on on the outside and and texture that you get on the bottom of the pizza when you put it back on the hearth and, and reheat it is I think what makes it distinct. It's it is a pizza that has texture, a chew, but then also a crunch uh, when you get to the edges. And the yeah. corner slice is always the the magic. The corner, of course. The, yeah. The, and didn't you make one for yourself for breakfast? Could you still have I it? Did. 
And I do. So, I, I have it so here. I'm going to describe it for those who are yeah. listening on the audio version. I want to describe what yeah. I'm seeing there because it looks, yeah. you know, have this incredibly beautiful square or rectangular pizza. It looks kind yeah. of Detroit style in a sense. It's yep. got this, uh, this uh, Frico around the edge with a little big cheese, dark brown cheese crust. And then, yeah. and it looks like it's about an inch, inch and a half thick. Um, yep. And then, of course, wait an inch. And yeah. then I'm seeing maybe, cheese. Maybe less. Maybe. Yeah. Is it is there sauce on there too, or just cheese? And so then this one is is a is a potato uh, pie, and I and I thought, potato. yeah, this is a potato, so a, a little bit unique, and and that you may or may not see something that has potatoes on it. Um, uh, certainly in prosciutto, say in a place like Detroit, um, or in America in general, it's a very Italian thing. Uh, it's a, it's a very Sicilian thing to to have potatoes, or Neapolitan thing to see like focaccia with potatoes lined up and a it's, little sprinkle yes. of rosemary over top. What we do that's a, a little bit unique here, and then I'll talk about the dough is that. Um, we because we have the wood fired oven next door, we we cook the potatoes first in in uh, salt, and then we take them and we roast them in the oven over there. So the potato becomes a little smoky, and that becomes the basis. We spread that puree uh, over the bottom of the pizza, olive oil, potato, salt only, and then we layer in fingerling potatoes on the top of it. So you get these little crispy, crunchy potato chippy type uh, 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 potatoes on the top, and then we put San Daniele prosciutto. On the top of this, I can't get the Sicilian uh, prosciutto, unfortunately, in this country, the uh, uh, near to Sicilia. Um, so this is a what I think the best one that we get, which is a prosciutto San Daniele, San Daniele fuoco, which is um, cured on the bone, and it just has a much more rich uh, uh, flavor profile to it. And then, of course, it has pistachios drizzled over the top of it that are, are cured in a little bit of oil. It's absolutely gorgeous, and it, you know, it's thanks. Uh, you sell it by the pie, by the by the square. How do you uh, how do people? Well, buy? both. So what, I think this is kind of a, a thoughtful process. So um, when you make pizza, of course, the, it's, to me, it's all about the bread and it's all about the crust, right? And and um, depending on the style of pie that you're making, I think there's a lot that goes into um, uh, the crust itself. And so in this case, we do ten by ten inch uh, uh, squares so that everything is a corner slice. That's that's the magic. Oh. Is that we cut it into quarters. And then everyone gets a corner slice because you want that maximum for me, the the crispiness of the edge, not the interior square is really the magic uh, uh, moment that happens in there. So um, we sell it by the slice in the restaurant, um, which is, uh, I don't know why people buy it by the slice when you could have a whole pizza, but they do. And um, and so oftentimes a, a bigger table will get a couple of pizzas to share. But but I think one of the things that's that's interesting about this style of pizza, even though it is a little bit thicker. It's very, very light because it's it is focaccia style pizza, and so people think like, oh, it's it's richer, it's heavier, but um, but in actuality, it's the same amount of dough weight that we put into uh, the dough next door when we make a Neapolitan pizza, which is a little bit crazy. So, so yeah. is it kind of a long uh, rise, the final rise in the pan before it goes into the oven? Yeah, um, it is um, slow rise, as you call it, and yeah. um, uh, the magic, the key to it all. The key to it all, yeah, it's a it's a uh, it's a three day fermentation process that that we put um, all of our pizza dough through. Um, different recipes. This has a little bit of um, uh, whole wheat flour in it, um, just to give it a little bit more you know flavor profile and and structure to it. Of course, it's all uh, high gluten flour. Uh, the rest of it, and then we use a sourdough starter on this side, uh, and um, we use a little bit more commercial yeast on that side, uh, just to keep it consistent because we do you know. 300 pizzas a day, 400 pizzas a day over there it gets a uh, gets to be a lot over time. So uh, at at Bar Pasquale, the pizza menu mainly are these um, Sicilian style or uh, yeah. square pizzas. Uh, are you yeah. are you doing calzones there as well? We do calzones, um, uh, but the calzones over here are very particular. Um, pizza fritta is a really classic thing in in Napoli and and particularly yeah. in Sicily. And um, I I had this amazing experience. Uh, in Catania, which is a, a port city, a beautiful port city um, uh, on the uh, coast of, of Sicily. And um, we, we were stumbling around near the fish market looking for a place for lunch. And I, I met a, a winemaker and he's like, oh, go go to this. Um, my friend has a restaurant, you know, not far from there. And so we went in there. And if you've ever been in Italy, when you walk into a restaurant, first of all, the lights are always like super bright. And, um, and there could be no one in there dining. And I always think about how did the logistics and financials work in these kind of places? Right. And and there was no one in the restaurant. I was like, wow, it's, you know, I don't know, two o'clock in the afternoon. There's no one here. 
Uh, but you know, we'd been recommended to, to have lunch there. And so we sat down at a table and of course the owner comes over. It's like, you know, you, 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 I know who you guys are yeah, and yeah. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate. My wife speaks fluent Italian. So it's easy for us to kind of get through, uh, navigate ourselves a little bit. And, uh, and we sat down and it was, an, it was a new restaurant. He had just opened it a couple of weeks prior. And so he was still kind of getting his feet under him, uh, hence the, the empty dining room. And, yeah. um, and, and. He's like, uh, let, let me let me make a couple things for you, and and we had this pizza Frida, and it absolutely stopped me in my tracks. And so I, I, I we talked to the chef for a little while, and um, uh, you know, a, a, incidentally, the chef was from Portugal, and and my chef is uh, from Portugal, Chris. Uh, so the two of them oh, started speaking yeah. Portuguese, and, I, yeah. and it just goes back to the idea that pizza is universal; it doesn't matter where you come from, uh, it travels the world. It's it's something that it's it's meaningful in every culture in its own way, and and um, and so we kind of brought that idea back. And so we do a pizza frita here, which is stuffed with anchovies and, and so uh, the, the first one, sheep's cheese. The one that blew your mind in, in Catania, was that uh, the, yeah. the anchovy? Uh, yeah. Because I saw on your on your Instagram, you know, you making one of those. Uh, right. It's, it's simplicity and elegance all at once. Uh, for those yeah. most of our listeners probably know that pizza frita means uh, deep fry, but just that's, that's a, the process there real key, quickly. Key right. factor, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's it's Neapolitan dough um, that we use. So we use the the Neapolitan dough from next door over here. Uh, we we stretch it out, lay it down, obviously stuff it, roll it over, and then it's fried uh, in olive oil and um, and then just a sprinkle of salt on it. And we and we just serve it with a knife. And, and the idea is when you cut it and you just open it up, it, it's like a taco. I mean, you just you just yeah. hold this half of a steaming hot pizza. It's all about um, the ooze factor. Oh that man, it's it's so good. So it's it's not a tomato sauce thing. This is a um, we've done it a few different versions of it, but uh, in my opinion, the the one stuffed with uh, sheep cheese and anchovies is is like. Do you, you have the, a particular type of anchovy? I know a lot of people are very fussy about very anchovies they use. So where so I'm very particular yeah. do you use and how do you where do you get them? How do you source them? Um, there's a few different uh, producers now. There used to only be one. Ortiz was the only one that we could get uh, really in the country that was that was worthwhile. But their Cantabrian anchovies always, uh, in my opinion, the best. They're 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 they are quite expensive, but but um, they're worth the money. You can you can actually buy the Ortiz brand in Whole Foods and in places grocery stores around the U.S., which I think is amazing. It's one of the really great products that you can pick up, and, and it adds a lot of depth to not just to pizza. Um, although I've been known to put a couple of anchovies on, on like a store-bought pizza from time to time to add a little yeah. flavor and depth, but it adds to pastas. It adds to, you know, stews, ragus, you know, all those kind of things that we make in the restaurants. Anchovies, uh, and chilies are things that we use for seasoning in our, in our restaurants. It's and well, just the, 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 the ubiquitous aspect of anchovies. Yeah. And, so are, are these anchovies uh, packed in salt or in oil? Well, you can get them both ways. The, the, the classic Cantabrians that, that we get here are fillets packed in olive oil. It's a great question. Um, they're salted first uh, and then packed in olive oil. So they're they're ready to consume versus uh, anchovies that are packed in salt, which you, you need to do some legwork. You got to take the bones out. You usually yeah. have to rinse them uh, to use them. No less enjoyable, um, but but the ones packed in olive oil are a little bit cleaner. Uh, as you're describing all this, I want to just jump on a plane and, and <laughs> as soon as I can. I'm hoping to get up this summer. Uh, uh, please. Uh, I'm down there in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we have, we're having good food, but you know, this is nothing like the diversity and creativity that's going on. You know, this within a couple blocks of uh, where you are, and in every yeah, sort of yeah, little square in, in New York City. Um, I know you're um, you're in in uh, right now in Bar Pasquale, and in a second. Yeah. We're going to take a break and be, and uh, you're going to head over to Pasquale Jones so we can see that operation. Um, yeah. For those who, who are watching, you can see in the background that there's a little kitchen activity going on so we can see a little taste of it. But before we go to the break, I was wondering if you'd do me a favor. Would you yeah. mind, I don't know how hungry you are, but would you mind cutting us a little oh, piece of that? Are you kidding uh, have, me? Have, a, have some breakfast on us. And, you know, I know. And, I'm gonna, you know and, and if you could sh uh, hold up to the camera. Um, of course. This, 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 the crumb structure as well. Yeah, so um, my guys uh, did a great job uh, uh, cutting this off. So I'll just kind of get that a little bit closer so you can yeah, see. It looks so creamy um, in the center. It, it really is. I think, um, you know, we, we've messed around with a lot that have um, a, a, a lot of different variations of, uh, of air holes. And what we found here is that one that, that's very, very light, um, um, almost pillowy, uh, soft uh, to the touch. Um, yeah. But allows us to get that really nice uh, kind of layer of crunch on the bottom, so you can you get a nice bite to the uh, to the bottom of the pizza without it being heavy. I think that's a really important part. And then uh, you can kind of see the the crust on the outside, 
Um, one of the secrets to that, of course, is uh, we do a little bit of um, uh, provolone cheese just around the uh, the pizza, which then huh? melts and helps give us that uh, that little bit of crunch around the outside without right. adding a lot of heft to the pizza. So there's not a lot of cheese on the pizza itself. It's only around Correct. the perimeter. Uh, Correct. Rico. All right. Here comes the crunch. You're taking a bite. Yeah. Oh, mm. well, good. The crunch is coming through. The, I can hear the sound. So mm. now I'm getting hungry. Yeah. And, and of course, that's, that's prosciutto. the prosciutto on top is just gorgeous, mm. paper thin. Um, mm -hmm. So so th so on the menu, this would be called what? Would this be called cinchoni or something else? We call it Sicilian pies here. Um, pies. You know, cinchoni is, of course, what we refer to it as when we talk about it to our to our um, guests and to our team members. Uh, but we try not to confuse anybody. It's a, it's another word they have to, yeah. to learn uh, as guests. We just say, look, you know, you're in Little Italy. These are Sicilian pies, um, and it's part of a meal. I think that's one thing just to just to leave on is that I think in a lot of pizzerias, um, uh, certainly the more well known ones, you're going there just to eat a pizza and have a beer or a glass of wine, and that's yeah. that's the meal. And I think that's something that's unique about about our pizzerias, and 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 I think that we do in America that you just don't see in Italy even is that this is meant to be, in Sicily, you, you just don't go to a pizzeria that's going to have cinchone. Cinchone is something you start with. You might have yeah. some fava beans and and maybe a little, you know, charred octopus or something, and then you'd have a little cinchone to to kind of eat. And then you'd have a bowl of pasta, and then maybe even, um, right. uh, you know, a piece of uh, pork that's been grilled over over wood. Um, and that's kind of a classic, you know, meal. And I, I think that understanding that pizza can be part of a meal uh, is engaging as opposed to just the meal. Um, and, and although it can be the star, I think it's, it's meant to, to really be part of it as you, as you transcend through an experience. Well, um, uh, do you have those other options? Do you do pastas and, and, yeah. and some entree courses there at, at bar? Yeah, pasta? yeah. No, of course. And, and, um, listen, I, I, you know, the whole reason I got into pizza, I, I just, I'm obsessed with pizza and, uh, we opened my first restaurant, I opened Charlie Bird 10 years ago. And when we got finished cooking at nighttime, we just wanted to go eat pizza. We didn't want anything that we could do that wasn't what we were doing. We wanted to go drink a great bottle of wine and eat pizza. And um, we, what we found was that um, there were a lot of pizzerias in New York City. Not a lot of them had great wine. Um, there were a few in Brooklyn that did have great wine lists, but they were they were hard to get to or they closed a little bit earlier. When we get there, they didn't take reservations and and you know those types of things. And so we we thought, man, we, we really need to do you know great pizza and a great wine list in in uh, in Manhattan. And uh, more specifically, really in Little Italy, we really felt like Mulberry Street was the spot. So, so we fought hard to uh, uh, to get a space there, and 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 that's what it's about. Is we, I think you should be able to drink a terrific bottle of wine, be it uh, from Europe or from America, um, and have a great wine list, and and be excited about eating pizza. And it's served yeah, the right yeah. way, and it's served in great stemware, and and the whole experience is is uh, is not just we don't just fall short, and you, you know you're forced to drink a beer or a soda. Uh, because uh, all they care about is the pizza, right? And and I think sometimes those cultures uh, are, are one sided a little bit. So that's something that we we really focus hard on in these restaurants. Well, in addition, you mentioned Charlie Bird, which is your first restaurant. Is that it's that's still happening? Charlie's still going? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. And, and so, we're about to celebrate June fourth. Is our tenth. So I'm seeing a list of uh, your whole restaurant group. Uh, it's a delicious hospitality. Uh, the group. Yeah. The the DHG. You guys got Charlie Bird. You got Pasquale yep. Jones. You Legacy Records. What is Legacy yeah. Records? Is that a, so a, music is is a real passion of mine, and 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 in all the restaurants. And so each each restaurant kind of has a spirit animal, if you will, that uh, that that we we tag onto and uh, and and kind of follow the playlist through that. And um, uh, Legacy is an old recording studio where where many famous artists uh, recorded yeah. uh, albums, and you, songs, and, 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 and you built there. it right there. In the, in and the so we just we took it over. It's on it's in uh, the west side of Manhattan on Thirty Eighth and Tenth, uh, and uh, it's okay. a very very cool spot. Yeah. And then what about Ada's Place? Ada's Place is a cocktail bar that's upstairs uh, from Legacy Records. It's a, uh, um, a really throwback um, to some of the classic cocktail bars. You know, come on, cocktail culture. You, you got to have to have a cocktail before you can go have great pizza or yeah, right. you know, great pasta. Yeah. Well, you're growing an empire there, and it's not uh, just in to... it's not just in Little Italy. It's 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 you're, you're covering the city, which is really exciting. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, well, I want to get uh, get over to uh, Pasquale Jones and see. Uh, and see what you're doing over there. So we're going to take a little Great. break right now. We're with Chef Ryan Hardy of all the restaurants we just mentioned. <laughs> he just took a, a, a bite and made us all jealous of of this uh, Sicilian pizza that looks to the naked eye like a Detroit-style pizza with that yeah. 
he cheese edge and uh, and it looked awesome a little bit of sicily a little bit of you know well a little bit of you really in, in this yeah. bike that you brought back from sicily so ryan let's continue this conversation uh in part two of our conversation with ryan hardy and join us back in part two Welcome back to part two of today's episode of Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, and I'm here with Chef Ryan Hardy. We've traveled from theological Jesuit university <laughs> studies to culinary schools to somehow New York City, where you are growing an empire of restaurants that sound very exciting. Uh, it, it's a, it's, a, it's just an amazing since in the 25 years since we last, you know, knew each other. Uh, yeah, the whole the whole world has opened up for you. It seems like you're. You're one of the one of the major players now in New York City. Thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I, I, there are so many uh, great restaurants in, in in and around the country now. I think when I was young, when I was in San Francisco back when I first met you, uh, you you really needed to go to one of the major cities. You know, telephones didn't exist. Certainly, social media didn't exist. Uh, people still used encyclopedias back then. That's and right. um, what, what's that? Uh, yeah, what's that? <laughs> And, is that know, anything I, I like afford, Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't afford to buy the books that I wanted uh, back in those days. So I would take, I would go to the bookstores and I would take a, a notebook with me and I would write down recipes uh, in these books wow. that I could then go, you know, yeah. try back home. But, but the reason I mentioned that is that you would, you would have to travel to, to France or to Italy or to Spain or to South America or to, to some of these places or New York City, if you wanted to go work for the best people uh, that were out there, you had to go learn it directly from them. And, and, and you know, things have changed, obviously, in the last decade, for sure. Um, uh, but for me, I think um, being able to to take people on a journey where they where it doesn't involve your phones or it doesn't involve uh, so many of the the distractions and, and, and beautiful things that we have in, in today's society um, uh, becomes really, really important. But New York City was always a love affair for me. Um, it was a place that when you were a line cook in San Francisco, back in those days, you knew that it was San Francisco, a little bit of LA and New York. Those were the major players. And now there's so many great restaurant cities around our own country and of course around the world that um, you can go to, to um, whichever Portland you choose to be in, uh, whichever, right. is, uh, right. whichever right. side of the country you're on, great food in both those cities. Um, uh, you can go to the uh, middle of Texas. You can go to you know all over the all over the country and, and, and including here, you know, in, in New York, it used to be really very specific to New York city. And when you got out in some of the outlying areas, um, things were, you know, a little bit more localized and, and now we're seeing terrific restaurants in you know, the farming, uh, Hudson river Valley or out in long Island, uh, in North Fork and South right. Fork and places like that, that, that really so have many, terrific restaurants now. So many forces have converged, you know, to bring yeah. about yet another new culinary sort of Renaissance, for us, and one of which is the sustainability movement and this, uh, under you know, the appreciation of artisan farming, milling, you name it, um, converging with all the talent. And there's the, the media side of it with with the travelogues and the work of Tony Bourdain and and uh, Food Network. And so everybody, the world has become, you know, in, it lives in your living room now. And then yeah. and if you're lucky, you live near a great restaurant where you can also go out and experience it for real and not just virtually. But and that's the thing about food is that you you know you can you can look up the you can look up uh, on Instagram you know Imasanelli in in uh, in Italy uh, but you have to go there to to yes. taste it and you've yes. you've got to to experience Caserta and, and the region and drive around it and and then and then you know get to the pizzeria and sit down and understand um, you know that particular pizza if you want to eat it you can't you can't box it you can't take it out you can't do anything you've got to travel to those things I think that's one of the the really cool things uh, that exist still in, in food is that we can we can read about it, we can we can take recipes, we can do whatever you want, but until you eat it, you, you don't have a good uh, frame of reference. Well, in the few minutes that we had in our break, you managed <laughs> to travel from Sicily to to, <laughs> to uh, you know, Naples, and and yeah. you're in, in the other side of the wall of your restaurants there. Mm -hmm. So you're Pasquale Jones now, and behind you uh, there are I'm seeing two beautiful wood burning ovens. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ovens and then we'll talk a little yeah. bit about, about what goes into those ovens. So, um, this is a corner space, as I mentioned on, on Mulberry street that, that, um, was fortunate that, that had, um, exhaust for, for wood burning. And it's, um, it's now, um, uh, been all but virtually outlawed in New York city. Um, is that right? wood, wood burning is, is just about gone. If you have it, you're grandfathered in good. Don't ever change it. And if you, uh, they're just about to to really look at gas regulations in 
in residential new buildings and, and really remove gas from a, from a lot of buildings going forward in, in New York as well. Not to say those are bad things, but I but I I understand just the value of being able to cook with um, uh, solid fuel uh, in in this day and age. It's it's, it's a challenge, and so um, being able to do that certainly in the middle of New York City with everything going on around you is is yeah. really a bit of a miracle. So when we looked at this, we we had um, a a bit of a design um, play to to move here. Um, we had the ability to put one big oven in the, in the middle of a room, right? And, and kind of everything flows through that. You yeah. have to make a decision when you when you have a wood oven, are you going to be pizza or are you going to try and cook everything else? And a lot of restaurants will do, oh, I'm going to put a little steak in there with the pizza or I'm going to you know, cook some vegetables in there on the side of the pizza, those kind of things. And um, when you go and you visit um, Ferrara and you go meet Stefano in, in Naples, um, they, they insist they, they're like, we will not sell you an oven. If you're going to put anything in this, but, but pizza, you will ruin the deck and, and you will not be able to, to cook pizza, uh, perfectly the way that these ovens are designed. And I, and I have to say that, that, that was something that was really a big concern for us, but bigger than that, we, we just looked at the size of the ovens and, and, you know, ovens come in, in all different uh, sizes in, in diameters. And we really looked at the, the ability of a pizzaiolo to manage a certain number of pies. Uh -huh. That's important, and and it's something that I don't think we talk about enough in in the in the world of pizzas. I think there's a point of pride in Italy that a great pizzaiolo can can produce one pie a minute, right? They can like pies are constantly coming out of the oven and then going out. That's good, but is volume really the end game? Is that really the goal here, or is it quality? And 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 so for us, I said, look, I think a great pizzaiolo can manage three, four pizzas max at a time. There's just no reason to push it beyond that. And so we went with a, with a smaller uh, diameter oven, which allowed us actually to put two ovens in, one for pizza and one for everything else. So we have the wood roasting oven here that we keep at about 585, 650 degrees on this side. It allows us to get that smoke. We can cloche the oven. We can you know, kind of finish our proteins, uh, smoke them there in the, in the last second, um, do some of the things that we'd like to do. And then on this side, you know, we, we really run the pizza oven. So this is, wow. this is upwards of uh, 850. Are they fundamentally different oven designs or are they the same oven? No, exactly, exactly the same oven. Um, both are Stefano Ferraras um, that, uh, that we installed. We've replaced the floors only once in them, which you know happens over time. So and the Ferraro um, folks didn't, uh, didn't mind that you were going to have one dedicated to non-pizza products. Uh, exactly. They were like, well, as long as you're not making pizza, you can do whatever you want. But <laughs> They probably but drop in from time to time to make sure you're not violating their rules. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, listen, there's, there's, there are several great oven producers out there. Um, I think there are three or four that really rise to the top. Um, and, and I think these guys are, are one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but starting with a great oven is, is really critical. I, I you know, it, it, it is, I will say, uh, with the new technology that's out there, some of the home ovens, I won't mention names uh, to give people, you know, too many props, but um, it, I have cooked in those ovens at people's homes just to, just to try them out and have some fun with them. And they produce really good quality pizza. Uh, if the dough is good, the ingredients are good, and you've got a little bit of skill and knowledge on it, uh, yeah. you can produce uh, great ovens without having, you know, something that's been shipped around the world and, and has, uh, you know, volcanic uh, bricks on the inside. Well, we could probably spend an entire whole show talking about yeah. this other issue you raised, which is which is the challenge that wood wood fire cooking is facing right yeah. now. Because if New York City is already starting to shut it down, then, you know, it's, it's only a matter of time. I know the gas industry is facing the same thing. That's a whole... Topic. So we got to have you back another time, and maybe get a couple <laughs> of people and have a roundtable yeah. and talk about. Yeah, this that's a great idea. Because these uh, these oven companies have to be also going. What the hell is going on right now? You know, if we yeah. can't produce, or if they have no, if we can produce them, but there's no one that's allowed to actually get a permit to use them. What are we going to do? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you gave me an idea for a future show, which hopefully will get you to be part of a, a discussion Perfect. on. This. I love, I love the panels. So, so. Um, uh, so this uh, these ovens, uh, especially your pizza oven, is dedicated to Neapolitan style pizzas. And I saw on your menu, I mean, some really creative work. I noticed that you, uh, you you're you're using anchovies. Right? We talked about anchovies always. Yeah, always. So anchovies a big part. Of it. But can you talk a little bit about your your pizza philosophy and your fermentation philosophy on your dough and the type of flour you're using? Yeah. Um... We use Caputo flour here. We, we've messed around with a few different uh, uh, high gluten flours. Um, uh, and hydrations uh, over the years. And, and uh, we've worked with, with pizzaiolos, not only in, in Italy, but of course in the U.S. Um, uh, we worked with uh, 
uh, Savoy in Japan also came over and cooked with us. And, and we kind of did a collaboration for a few days and, and really understood their dough and how they make their doughs. And um, uh, it's, it's, once again, that's, that's one of the coolest parts of, of the pizza world is that it's this, it's this subculture, it's this language that's, that's bubbling like the dough itself uh, uh, with, with creative ideas and, and interesting ways to, uh, to do it. Um, I think um, uh, there's just so much, so much talent out there and so many different variations on, on, on all sides of it. Um, you know, yeah. we've got, you know, Nanjiri and, and, you know, uh, uh, his, you know, restaurant down the street here, uh, which is just like the guys, you know, like Beethoven uh, and what he does oh, yeah. with, with so, and then, and then I you've call, got the other I, I call, I referred to him when, when, when one of our earlier episodes as the Chopin of pizza. There you go. Cause, exactly. Cause he, right. Cause he's a minimalist. He just focuses on one Total. style and he just right. like, goes deep. That's it. He's like, yeah. that's all I'm doing today. And he's got, Anthony uh, Mangieri, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just incredible. And, and then you've got, you know, the other side of that, which is like the, Hey, we're, we're New York, Neapolitan, and then we're going to cook kind of Neapolitan pizza. We're going to do it kind of in a, you know, in a New York uh, fashion. So, I don't know where we fall on that dial. I think we're we're maybe a little bit more on the religious zealot style uh, <laughs> side of it. Um, but um, um, but but the, but Caputo we're, has we're, done an amazing job of uh, of getting their flour over here. Uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, hardly anybody knew about about very, that yeah, brand. And it was very and, difficult. And to get, even if you knew about it, you couldn't get it. Now yeah, yeah. Uh, you Correct. must work with Orlando Foods as, as one of your. Uh, Yep, yep, we do. And, and, um, and, you know, we, we tried a lot of uh, local milled stuff in New York and, and we do that. We have a bakery as well uptown at, above legacy records. And, uh, and we use a lot of flowers for that. And we're going back to experiment for some of the doughs that we do here. It's like, how come, how can we start now that we, we, we've had a decade of really working on this stuff. How do we start to work in, you know, more of those things? The, the problem that we find is consistency is a real challenge huh. when you're putting out uh, pizza doughs, uh, you know, we, we'll do anywhere a slow day for us is a couple hundred pizza doughs. A really busy day for us could be three or four hundred pizza doughs. And so when you've got that kind of volume, how do you produce that uh, consistently day over day? Um, how does the pizza oil react to it? And, um, uh, you know, if, if, you, if it's if it's just just myself or just Chef Chris or just Chef Stefan, who's was over here in the off the picture as well. If it was just us making the pizza every single day, every single pie. Uh, that would be different. But I think, you know, being able to teach other people and 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 have other pizza oils come in who are bringing their own influence and look at the dough, we want to provide some consistency through that. And, and that's really why we think the Caputo has been um, uh, really terrific for us. So how do you handle your your dough? What, what's your your sort of life cycle of your dough from start to finish? Um, great question. Um, our dough is um, uh, obviously mixed downstairs. We have a kitchen downstairs. Um, it is mixed. Um, we, we, we don't mix by hand. We mix in a, in a, um, a mixer, um, uh -huh. just flour and, and water, um, to, uh, to get it started with, um, really mix that and get the, get the hydration, um, uh, going first. I think we're at 62 and a half percent water, uh, uh -huh. on, uh, on flour. Um, uh -huh. we're, we're kind of experimenting with a few more doughs that are a little higher hydration, which we, which we've had some success with in the past and kind of starting to, you know, experiment with. The seasonality, of course, is always a, a thing because humidity in the air, um, humidity in the rooms downstairs, you know, natural temperature, even though our, our rooms are, are controlled, you're still going to get those those hot days, a lot of deliveries happening, you know, those kind of things. And so it's you still have to kind of control it. But anyway, then we add the um, uh, the yeast and, and we go through auto uh for a period. And then um, I think it's 20 minutes uh, just to kind of like, you know, let everything nestle yeah. together. And then. And then we bring it up, uh, add the the, uh, the remainder of the water, salt, and and um, um, uh, mix that together um, until we you know r really have that dough form, which I think is another twenty minutes or thereabouts. No, it's, I think it's a, it's a shorter time. I think it's about seven or eight minutes on that one. Um, and then um, and then we let that bulk ferment. That that so that sits uh, out for about two hours uh, until we're really starting to see the, the maturation uh, come alive there. And then we uh, cold ferment that overnight. Uh, uh, we ball it the uh, the second day okay. and um, uh, in the boxes, and then the third day, uh, you know, in the evening is when it's ready for use. So we're 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 constantly making dough because if we're open for lunch yeah. and dinner, it can't be. Oh, we made this night on Tuesday. Use it for Thursday lunch. It's got to be night on Tuesday. For yeah. men, you know, you got dough at different when, stages. You got to have space correct. for all that dough. You got to have space for that correct. stuff. Yeah, and that's another challenge. You know, places like New York don't have a lot of space, and you know, it's it's a real premium to be able to uh, to do that. So you're, we're constantly moving dough into different life cycles. 
Well, before we actually make a pizza with you, which uh, I see you, uh, your your chef uh, Chris is back there, We're getting there. Fire one up yeah. for us, and we'll and, and we'll see it because because uh, in the photos it, they're gorgeous pizzas, obviously Thank you. beautiful leoparding and Thank everything. You. But, yeah, but um, not everybody who uses the double zero flour goes through the long three day process that you go through. Yeah, Let's talk a little bit in your discovery of, of you know nailing your dough. Yeah, why you decided, and and are you noticing differences? If you just take it on the second day, because some for some people the second day is enough, and and second day is plenty. Yeah. Of five days. Uh, yeah. you know, what are you seeing the differences? For us, I I really want that flavor, you know, maturity in there because we're not doing it. We do a sourdough starter uh, next door. Um, we don't do it over here, and um, uh, we're using commercial yeast here, uh, which which you know you're obviously going to start with a consistency product. We started off with a starter when we opened the restaurant, and we just had too many variations in the beginning. Right, right. Uh, that that was that was a challenge for us. Um, you know, we got to pay rent, <laughs> so oh, yeah, we got to be open. You know, and and you have to have control to too. And control yeah, is such control. a big factor. So we're, we're you know, we're, like I said, we're pushing the zealot side of things, but there's a business to run, and we're you know, we're kind of uh, you know, dialing it in there and saying, how can we get the best possible product that is extraordinarily authentic? Um, uh, and and you know, we don't go outside the lines on on toppings too much, but can can really give us a great consistent product. Um, so for for us, we just did it through a trial and error. I think as the as the the yeast, uh, you know, really develops and, and um, uh, into that third day, we, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm talking to the expert here, but I really look at the balls of dough and you can, you can just see them kind of rise their tension when they're, when they're new, even the next morning after you've balled them up, they're, they're, they're still quite firm. And then you see them kind of ease by the afternoon yeah. and then they really relax those shoulders um, uh, as you kind of get towards midnight and, you know, and you're, you're ready to start using them the next day. Um, I actually prefer the the three day and even into four day uh, on the dough where it's where it's really getting old. You really get that that um, super puff on on the outside of the uh -huh. of the dough um, because everything you know the elasticity of the dough starts to relax uh, quite yes. a bit, and um, uh, as as you know all of that stuff gets consumed by the yeast uh, over time. And, and if you get the hydration level right, it's it takes nothing to open those doughs. You just kind of like boop boop boop, and and uh, you barely have to slap it. To uh, to open that up and, and yes, get that the, the enzymes have, yeah. have totally relaxed the protein yeah. so that they're consumed they're just, it. Yeah, yeah very easy so, Whereas I think a New York style, which is you know like I talked about about dial, you know something that's maybe a little bit more um, traditional New York is going to have a lot of that gluten. Um, they're making it same day or they're letting it rest yeah. overnight and using it the very next day. And 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 it's it's that stuff you could slap, you could you could spin it, you could twirl. You're never going to poke a hole in it. Because um, uh, it's got such strength to that dough right. that mm -hmm. that um, you see those videos of the guys like twirling it between their legs and you know that kind of stuff and um, uh, it's cool to watch. But um, you can make very very thin pizzas doing that, of course, and, and get that crackling crust. I mean, there's a lot of value uh, to that protein structure. But for us, uh, that really traditional side of things yeah. is is it's about it's meant to be bread. I mean, that's that's really the definition of pizza is it's meant to be bread that's topped with some some beautiful stuff. And so. I think um, uh, you know owning that was how we really got to that three day fermentation. I would think that with a long extended fermentation that you have, uh, that uh, you're only really using just a very small amount of yeast. Can you talk very a little small. bit? Like like yeah, have you have you broken it down into percentages or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, um, I, I I think it's it's like point one two percent yeast. Yeah, um, uh, a a ratio, yeast, so it's tiny. Uh, we use the uh, the Red Star uh, instant yeast, yeah, and, okay, and so it's a so fresh yeast would be you know was it double or two and a half times that, but um, uh, it's a, it's a tiny amount. In fact, it, it I make it kind of makes me laugh because when I make like traditional Easter breads and stuff, it's about four times the amount. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. Of yeast it is, and you're like, wow, it's a it's a it's really a thimbleful of uh, of yeast more or less uh, that goes into uh, uh, twenty kilos of, uh, of flour. That's cool because you know this balancing act of time and temperature and ingredients. It, it, it there's an infinite number of variations that you can do with that. But time yeah. is the ingredient that most people don't think about. And when you introduce time to it, um, then you have to adjust the other ingredients. And, yeah. and so it's so cool to know that it just takes that little bit of yeast, you know, to raise the loaf and to make it happen. And I know, uh, you know, something I learned from you when I took that took your class all those years ago was. You don't even really need the yeast. I mean, if you put those ingredients together and just let it sit long enough, it's going to find its way. Eventually, it will. And it's it's going to do it. And 
you know, we put that in obviously to kind of control the process and, and allow the, um, uh, the Petri dish, if you will, and a controlled environment to, to kind of, uh, you know, mature. Um, but yeah, it, it really takes very, very little. Um, uh, and, and I think part of it is that hydration rate too, is that, yes. um, you know, it's got, it's got plenty of water to, to, uh, to circulate and, and um, uh, really help uh, as it, as it, as it matures. Well, uh, back when you were a student at, at the CCA, as we call it, the California yeah. Academy, and we, I mean, this was really early in the artisan bread movement. Most people didn't even realize the importance of the enzymes that were are built into it. And, and we had a moment, you may have been there at the school when this happened, where we had a visiting uh, author come through when we were talking about how, how loaves brown up and some brown up you know, better than others. And why do you think that is? And just off, she just threw off a, a you know, sort of the comment that well some of them may have had more more malt than the other oh. uh, active malt diastatic malt and maybe the, the one that's not dark enough maybe you could just bump the the malt and somehow like these light bulbs went off for me and all of a sudden yeah. I, I started down this track that's like the rabbit hole of enzymes and i realized this is the missing ingredient this is the key to the whole thing is understanding how enzymes affect dough not enzymes that you necessarily have to add which most flour right. companies do they add yeah. malt, malted barley for yeah. the enzyme but there's already enzymes in there and then yeah. one of the ways is to give the enzymes time to do their job and all yeah. of a sudden this, this whole notion of you know why lo longer slow fermented uh, doughs are better is that the enzymes are able to release flavor that you can't get to if you try to do it quickly yeah i i love that and, and i think you you've talked about this a little bit on your podcast but but the idea that um you're breaking down gluten structures as well which then become uh, much more consumable to human beings the longer that fermentation goes um there's a lot of doctors out there a couple of famous ones that we know that that have done quite a bit of research on this and and uh have, have really talked about you know that being a a method to being able to consume bread uh for people who yes. are maybe um, you know, slightly intolerant uh, is a good way to say it. Uh, to to some of it, we we we're working on that actively to kind of understand how do we how do we work that into the world of pasta? How do we how do we yes. kind of understand this in a in a better sense? Um, yeah, because because pasta is also a big part of your menu too. Yeah, yeah, of course. And um, and so anyway, I, I, it's interesting because I can I can tell you that that I have two stomachs. I have one for pizza and one for everything else. I could <laughs> I could eat a ten course tasting menu. And then I can go eat pizza afterwards. But You're a I ruminator. It, yeah. <laughs> if I reverse it and I eat pizza that's not long ferment, I'm I'm like, oof, man, I feel yeah. stuffed. And yeah. but when I eat long ferment uh, uh, breads in general, I can just you know, just keep going. It's a it's it's it, it just it makes sense in in, in the scientific world. So. Uh, so it's kind of fun to. You're going uh, to have to leave your two stomachs to science when you when when the time comes. Here's why. Yeah, I was going to say I think you touched on something really interesting when you said you know leoparding and and I, I know a lot of people listeners that 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 follow your podcast know what that term means. It's something we talk a lot about in here. We use the word suntan. Um, uh -huh. That's a bad word. Um, uh, we uh -huh. use the word leoparding to kind of understand what the spots are on the outside of the dough. And I think a lot of that comes. We really see beautiful leoparding um, uh, and, and and you know dough um, um, uh, structure uh, changes when we get to that third day when the when the enzymes have really consumed a lot of that and, and created oh, um, you know freed up some of the sugars yeah. and some of the other uh, cool things that, that that you know turn out from the digestion process and and it really helps us. Of course, that it comes from the temperature of the oven. Of course, right. it comes from uh, um, you know the dough itself and and how it was made. Uh, but but I think you're seeing a lot of that. Um, that not necessarily through a malting process, of course, but but through that um, you know long uh, slow rise. Interesting. Well, your oven is glowing behind you. I can see. Yeah, it. let's check it out here and let's see if we can get a what, pizza. What, out what's of your this. typical baking yeah. timber? What are you shooting for before you? So start? this is uh, this is uh, shooting at um, the the very center, which is near the 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 fire, is going at nine twenty now. Um, that's high. Very, we don't yeah. we don't normally run it that high. The zones that we cook in are shooting at 8:30, and that's that's about right for us. What, what we what we do in this um, restaurant is is something that's maybe a little bit different. Um, I I kind of I don't know if I coined this term, but I like the idea of it. As I call it, neo New York yes. uh, pizza, and and the idea that it's it's 100% Neapolitan from start to finish. We just run the oven a tiny bit lower so we can get a pizza that you can pick up and fold. That's, that's yeah. interesting to me is it can't be dry 
but I don't want a pizza like they serve in Naples that you got to eat a knife and fork, eat the center right. of it and pick that up. New Yorkers I don't think, care for that that style. Exactly. I think what you're recognizing is the American palate there. And, a little and, bit, yeah. 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 So so you you, kind know, of you gotta play the crowd a little bit. The, yeah, a little uh, uh, compromise there, their happy balance, so to speak. Yeah. Because uh, so, a lot of people, like Nancy Silverton, for instance, she'll make yeah. her version of a neo Neapolitan pizza, but or what you call it, Neapolitan ish. But she bakes it for five to six minutes, and, and for yeah. because she wants the emphasis to be on each slice being able to stand out straight and have have a crunch factor still. But it still well, looks I, like a Neapolitan pizza. I know, and I love Nancy. We actually just did a Pasquale Jones pop up in LA at Pizzeria Mozza oh. this past weekend, oh, wow. uh, which was and which I was did. so much fun, and it was fun to cook in that oven and kind of play with that lower temperature. And and you know what we did was we said, well, what if we what if we go up 50 degrees? Let's try your pizza dough and we'll try our pizza. Yeah. Okay, what if we go up 100 yeah. degrees? Let's try your pizza dough and let's try our pizza. And so we had a lot of fun kind of messing around that with the chef awesome. team there and, and seeing uh, uh, how that how that Were you there for out. the uh, for the LA Pizza Festival? Were you uh, there? No, when... we weren't. We were there for, um, we did a, a, a private event uh, where they did a buyout. They wanted to, to bring us out there. And so we decided, right. oh, let's do a collab while we're there. Uh, and so the, the next night was open to the public. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. Oh, All boy, right, Chris is gonna make a pizza here. All right, um, let's do it. That's, we're... And um, go ahead, talk the pizza. I'm gonna I'm gonna take it like this and kind of show you guys. You can so see the Chris's hands on the pizza now. So I'm gonna describe yeah. it for listening yeah. on the audio version. Uh, so we've got the the the, the shell's been uh, stretched out to about looks like about 12 inches or yep, so. 12 inch. Yep. Mm -hmm. And and a beautiful you know vibrant red sauce. Are those tomatoes uh, ones that you bring in from Italy or San, where? yeah San Marzano? Um, and then uh, you know for I'm sure listeners who are real pizza lovers, they're never cooked. They're raw pizza uh, uh, tomatoes. Um, we we uh, clean the tomatoes up, um, uh, mill them. Um, I like a little bit of the seed and and some yeah. of the the, the, the texture that picture. comes through in the milling process. I'm I'm a fan of that. Um, then we put on two different types of mozzarella, um, see, the mozzarella exactly. buffala, yeah. and um, of course, um, um, uh, the Fiore in so there. The then, so so uh -huh. you've got both buffalo mozzarella and cow's milk mozzarella going on here in Correct. Little, little cubes. Yep. Of, and then I see and some then, some leaves of basil. Yeah, the leaves of basil, a pinch of, uh, of Parmigiano, uh, Parmigiano, and then a, a, a drizzle. We use a really great uh, oil from Puglia, um, this family, which I, I, I'm in love with, called De Carlo. Oh. And um, the De Carlo family has been making olive oil since 1600. We uh, we try and take a trip there uh, every year and and uh, see oh, the team nice. and, and taste the oils. Go for harvest when we can. Fantastic. I'm gonna put, the, I'm gonna put this back here and let okay. Chris get in here. Chris is going. Away. Chris Let's has go got ahead. it onto. He's moved the pizza onto the peel. Looks like a classic yeah. margarita pizza going into the oven and sliding off the peel into the oven. <laughs> and what's your typical bake goes. time? Would you say? Oh, 90 seconds thereabouts. Um, so, it. so it's a little oh, bit so cooler cool. than than say the 900 degree zone, but it's still fast enough to fit within the what would you call it the the Naples rules, you know? Yeah, yeah, 90 exactly. Seconds. 90 seconds. Well, just, maybe get a 90 little seconds, bit more. maybe two minutes uh, on it. Um, just, this particular one, since this is the first pizza that we're cooking, uh, yeah. we haven't cleaned the floor of the oven yet. Uh, we haven't done a few things, so we'll we'll kind of see how this comes out. We have we're, a couple we're of your, here. We we're your out. beta test today on the oven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Normally, so we'll it must be getting off. close to opening time for you guys too. Or you, what? What time do you start? Serving? We don't open for lunch uh, on uh, uh, Wednesdays just yet. We, we're just oh. uh, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, post COVID hours, uh, dinner seven nights a week, lunch on the weekends. I but see. we're just about to open for lunch. Um, it's today's May tenth. I think it's not Mother's Day. It's the following, so we'll be open five oh. days for lunch, wow. starting in a couple weeks. Well, I'm glad I we got you on this, before then. This, I know as this pizza comes out, you, you can see some of the leoparding there. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can see it. Chris is uh, giving a little close. rotation. He's going to spin it, he's gonna spin it around. Yep, and um, we're, seeing, we're seeing the browning, the the the. the yep. uh, the leoparding on the on one side, the side closer to the back wall. So he's moved Correct. it around. We're back getting wall and, and more even yeah. back. And then at some point, I'm guessing he's going to dome it. Do you think? Yeah, he'll dome it right at the end. Um, and the doming is is um, what, what kind of helps us control a few few factors in there. One is um, that that final kind of kiss of melting the cheese or dehydrating the pizza. We work with a few different um, yeah. toppings here. One of them, for example, is clam. That's the signature of the restaurant. I noticed here. that the clam is a big part of your menu. And I, that, big, and I or, once I saw yeah. that, like you had me at clam okay. pizza. So yeah. Okay. And um, uh, I think the the ability to um, uh, put clams on a pizza, it doesn't go with red sauce. It has to go with uh, panna, which is, uh, you know, cream yes. that gets put on the pizza first. But then you've got whipped cream, 
that has to deflate and then reduce. Otherwise, you oh. get a really soupy yeah. pizza. And so you've got to get that that dehydration just right. And so we'll dome it just to kind of like give it a little kiss and sometimes let it sit in the window for just 10 seconds while it just kind of sits there and bubbles and then it comes back. All uh, right, the pizza just came out. He's cutting so, it now. So uh, uh, can you get the camera to... Uh, yeah, he's going to bring it right over here. Okay, so bring, in the, bring in the pizza. So he's he, it's pulled out. It, it, it took less than two minutes to bake for sure. Now we've got yeah. a bake. So there. We're looking at your pizza now. And for those uh -huh. who can't see this, I'm going to describe it. We're seeing again, those leopard Pretty spots good, all around the cornice. You got a great pop in the, yeah. uh, in the, in the, the perimeter the cornice is uh -huh. uh, popping. The cheese is all melting gooey like, uh, um, and how's the undercrust? Oh, there you get some browning on the undercrust as well. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it, this is, you know, we look out for stuff like this, which, uh, which is a little bit of a dark spot. We didn't clean the oven floor before we, cause we were firing it up right as we got on the air here. So this kind of stuff will take care of itself. But, but um, typically, I love, the, well, I love it when it gets dark on the bottom, even if yeah, it's a little bit of, <laughs> but what, what, what you see here is, is you can actually pick this uh, pizza up and it's, and it, although it's quite soft in the middle, it's, it's just firm enough that it holds that, that yes. edge that's what and we're you, looking for and you're able to in fold it in your hand and, yeah but hand holds so it's that's in new york right out. Right? yeah yeah go. that's new york you got to be able to uh to pick your pizza up in new york if that's, you give people a knife and fork what is this you know what i don't, I don't know what to do with this thing that's that's um, you and john travolta walking down the street eating your place <laughs> <laughs> oh there so now you get the, you get the, the best part you get to taste it mm. and there you go so um the and, and of course that's you know, great and I, I'll kind of show you, like, um, you know, some yeah. of the, the cornicione, which is there we um, go. So now, you know, now right on the side we're there. looking real close up you. At, the, at the cornicione, oh. and it's and it's aerated. It's it's opened up like a ciabatta bread. So it's, like, it's like yeah, the best ciabatta you ever had. Yeah, and you know, we we, we force it down a little bit because uh, because obviously we, we just cut it, but you kind of get the idea there. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you got the flat part, and then the cornicione, which is a real technique thing, and I, and it's something that we focus on a lot here in the restaurant. Um, this is great, Chris. Thank you. Uh, which is how you open the dough. And, and if you, if you open the dough a couple of different ways, you can really force the air out of the dough. And, and if you, for example, if you take a, a, a rolling pin and open yeah. the dough, yeah. uh, it's a very, very different, um, um, experience, uh, it's with your finished pizza. product, of course, it's a whole different yeah. pizza, um, than, um, than how we open the dough. And so there's the slap technique, uh, of course, you know, you kind of open it and, and, you know, over your, over the back of your hands, but but protecting that cornichone before it goes in the oven, I think is a is a important part of the uh, rising process. So, uh, so you showed us uh, your, your margarita, classic margarita pizza. Yeah. There. Now, uh, I want to go back to the clam pizza because uh, I was curious when I was reading the menu. Are those yeah. clams in the shell, and what kind of clams are you using, or are they out of the shell and just? Uh, Man, I'm, I'm I'm so glad you asked that, Peter. We, and, and by the way, we didn't rehearse this at all. No, no, but <laughs> so you know, but you got to know if you're talking clam pizza, yeah. I'm going to be like totally yeah, yeah, all over that. Yeah. So um, first you need to know that uh, clam pizza is a very New York thing. And when I first started coming here, by the way, Lombardi's Pizza, which is, you know, by most accounts, the very first pizzeria in the United States is one block up from here. Right. And I so I came, yeah. yeah, I came to, I man, I ate Lombardi's so many times uh, when I first yeah. came to New York. And uh, I just, I just loved it. I, I thought it was the, the quintessential uh, um, pizza. It was, it was the, it was the bar to measure all others. And although I knew of Neapolitan, I certainly loved it. To me, I was, a, I was a neophyte in New York, and, and I, I thought that was really the coal-fired stuff was so cool. And I think um, uh, when you, when you look at a menu like that, and 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 you're new to New York, and you see a clam pizza on there, I was like, ah, it sounds weird. Like, who orders a clam pizza? Right. And then I finally ate one in, in various places around the city. And I was just, I was blown away by um, the opportunity of putting seafood on pizza it had never really occurred to, to me as a more traditionalist. Right. And so when we opened here, um, uh, I said, guys, we're going to do, we're going to do clam pie. Like this is good, <laughs> you know, this is going to get real. And we're like, oh, man, like really, how are we going to figure this out? And so um, uh, we did, we tested a few different ways and, and yes, to answer your question, we steam uh, little neck clams, um, we, um, uh, take them out of the shell. The juice that comes off of, of those clams is really the magic. Yes. Um, that has to be reduced down and then folded into whipped cream. And that goes on the base of the so pizza. That, that clam just goes into the cream. So basically you Correct. got a, you got a clam got a chowder clam. going underneath. <laughs> Correct. It's a great way to say it. The clam yeah. chowder that goes onto the pizza before the, the fire roasted broccoli rob gets chopped up and then it goes on top of the pizza, a little bit of chili flake. And then we chop the clams, the, the, uh, the clams themselves, of course, 
uh, you can use, you know, different types of clams, but, but the, you know, the smaller the clam, the more tender they are. And um, uh, little necks for us because, you know, Long Island is where we, we get some yeah. of these clams from and all the way up to Cape Cod. We, you know, we try and stay as local as we can there. We chop those up and then sprinkle those on the pizza. And that goes in the oven. And, and what ends up happening is a really delicate balance. The cornichon has to puff. Otherwise, the cream runs all off the pizza. Because what happens to whipped cream on, in temperature is it melts and the air um, uh, drops the cream. Everything liquefies again, of course. And the cornichon has to puff at just the right time for the cream to reduce. So now you have this swimming pool of, of cream that's caramelizing around the outside or inside of the pizza, I should say. And um, uh, if, you, if you miss that by any chance, let's say you, you didn't stretch the dough well or you've got a hole in it or whatever, boom, that pizza's gone. You got you to gotta take that out. But when you nail it and you get this yeah. uh, reduction of the cream on the pizza, you get this um, uh, you know, pizza bianco without cheese. And it's just the the cream. It's pizza con panna, and uh, it, it to me it's it's the it's the most elevated version of of what uh, maybe a modern pizza can look like. And I say I modern think, because traditional is very much pizza margarita uh, yeah. and and kind of the derivations that happen from there. Well, when I've had clam pizzas like in Italy, in Rome, or anywhere, I was always yeah. like disappointed because it would come with like six little clams and a half in right. the shell. You know, opened up and I'm going, I want clams. I, when I, you know, I want I clams. Want clam yeah. I don't want a clam tease. Yeah. And, 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 and what you're describing is more what I'm, what I'm looking for. Um, and it's, and yet it's very different from say the Frank Pepe's famous clam pizza where they, do, there's no sauce, no, no, no chowder underneath the clams. It's just oil, yeah. and clams, you know, and it's, and yeah. that's good also, but I, this sounds like you've kind of elevated it to make it your own. Yeah, and, and and there are lots of different versions, as you mentioned. Some have tomato sauce, some have some have nothing but olive oil and, and you know a squeeze of lemon. Some have cream. Uh, I've seen that that people reduce the cream down uh, beforehand and then put it on the pizza. Uh, uh, what we found was that from a portioning standpoint, the ability uh, to put that on the pizza, we needed something that was a little bit uh, stabilized uh, and and was able to to put it on. Um, so whipped cream gave us that that version of you could we could do a canal of it. You know, you could put on, you can portion it. You know exactly how much to put on. Whereas when you when you work with the liquid side, it became very very difficult for us to uh, to to get that cornichon just right. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. the pizza came out too dry, or vice versa. You had too much liquid, and you couldn't you couldn't actually keep it in the dough uh, and control it getting it in the oven. Well, Chef Ryan Hardy, you. Uh... You, you 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 got me on a plane already in my mind. I, mean, <laughs> I can't wait to can't have wait you. To have this. Those of you who are who are listening or watching, yeah, we're talking about the pizzas at uh, uh, we're at uh, which Pasquale one? Jones. Right. Yeah, this, this is this is Pasquale Jones. So right. which is next door to Bar Pasquale, where they're doing the right. more you know, Sicilian style pizzas. Uh, one stop for a, a whole big tour. Come uh, check out both. Uh, and we, we have yeah. people that come and they sit down here, they order a bottle of wine. They're like, okay, we're going next door. We're going to drink some tequila and we're going to eat some Sicilian next door. It's like, great, come on in. Yeah, it's well, awesome. thank you. Uh, Mulberry Street is where it's happening. And uh, and uh, Ryan, thank you so much. It's been great reconnecting with you after all these same. Yeah, same, you, same, same, same. But your adventures and where you've taken it. Uh, it's always great for anyone who's in the education side of culinary work to know that the students are out there doing it and using what they learned and actually, you know, That's succeeding great. beyond all of our wildest imagination. So congratulations on all of that. And thank, uh, thank you, you so much. Request. I will see you in person one of these days soon. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us on this episode of Pizza Quest. And we'll see you at the next episode. 